memory is the king. Memory is the king of our brain, where all simple and complex executions occur. Memory is the most important part of individual identity and is the backbone of our experience of the world. As our life is made up of moments and memories, it is the brick and mortar of our personalities that define our individuality, thinking, and acting. It helps us to function in society, remember things, and learn new skills. We use our memory from waking up in the morning to going to sleep. And even then, the memory processes are busy at work. Memory is the processes of remembering. We all have a different understanding of what memory means to us. Therefore, it's important to comprehend how it formulates and functions in order to have a better understanding to improve it for better mental health and well-being. In this video, which is based on the review of Lisa Genova's recent book Remember, we shall explore the science of memory and the art of forgetting. Basically, memory is the process of recording and retaining information by an individual. It has many flavors, and not all memories are created equal, but each memory is processed and organized in our brain in distinctly different ways. Some memories are built for only a few seconds, while others can last a lifetime. Some are easier to create, others are easier to retrieve, and still others are more likely to be forgotten. You can depend on some kinds of memory to be highly accurate and reliable, and others, much less so. As memory is central to our functioning and identity, we always have a fear of forgetting. And this is not only due to the dread of aging, dementia, or Alzheimer's, but also to the loss of our memory capability. So when we start becoming forgetful and begin forgetting words, names, purses, etc., the fear overtakes us that we might lose ourselves. Physical Aspect of Memory Neurologically, memory is the result of a lasting physical alteration in our brain in response to our experiences of not knowing something to know something and to be able to remember it in the future it registers the episode in a unique pattern of neural activity throughout the brain after the sensory emotional and factual elements of what we experience are perceived through the portals of our senses that is what we see hear smell taste and feel the lasting change in neural architecture and connectivity can later be re-experienced or remembered through the activation or triggering of this now-linked neural circuit. Steps of Memory Creation 1. Encoding. The brain captures the sights, sounds, information, emotion, and meaning of what we perceived and paid attention to and translates all this into neurological language. 2. Consolidation. The brain links the previously unrelated collections of neural activity into a single pattern of associated and distinct connections. 3. Storage. This distinct pattern of activity is maintained over time through persistent structural and chemical changes in those neurons. 4. Retrieval. You can now, through the activation of these associated connections, revisit, recall, know, and recognize what you learned and experienced in past. Hippocampus, our memory weaver, we're not entirely sure of how does a constellation of previously unrelated neural activity become bound together into a connected neural network as a memory. But we know where it happens. The information contained within an experience that is collected by our brain's sensory perceptions, the language, and then the who, what, where, when, and why, is linked by a part of our brain called the hippocampus a seahorse-shaped structure deep in the middle of our brain. The hippocampus is essential for memory consolidation because it binds our memories and experiences and acts like a memory weaver. The hippocampus links all these separate pieces of information from several parts of the brain together and knits them into a retrievable unit of associated data or a neural network, which when stimulated is experienced as a memory. The capabilities of the hippocampus are noticed after the most famous neuroscience case study of Henry Malaisen, or H.M., who earlier regularly experienced debilitating seizures unresponsive to drug treatment. So on September 1, 1953, 
At the age of 27, Henry agreed to undergo experimental brain surgery by a neurosurgeon named William Scoville, who removed his hippocampus and surrounding brain tissue from both sides of Henry's brain. Henry's seizures almost entirely subsided, and his personality, intelligence, language, motor function, and ability to perceive were undamaged by the procedure. In that sense, the surgery was a success. But he had tragically traded one plague for another. The bad news was catastrophic, because for the next 55 years until his death at the age of 82, Henry could no longer consciously remember any new information or experience for more than a few moments. He would never again create a consciously held long-term memory. He lost the capability of creating long-term memory due to the absence of the hippocampus. He continued to work with short-term memory, which he always forgot after a few seconds. He read the same magazines and watched the same movies over and over as if he had never seen them before. However, he still retained the long-term memory and continued his life. Memory Storage and Retrieval Hippocampus develops new memories, but where are they stored? It's disseminated throughout the respective brain areas that registered its original experiences. Unlike perception and movement, which have unique brain addresses, humans don't have memory storage neurons or a memory cortex. Visual cortex neurons process what we see. We smell with our olfactory cortex and hear with our auditory cortex. Pain, temperature, and touch are in your sensory cortex. A unique collection of motor cortex neurons activates during body movement. But memory is unique, and there is no memory bank. Our brain has multiple locations for long-term memories. Our brain stores memories in the neural activity that was activated when the event or information was initially encountered. Our recollection of last night's movie involves the same constellation of different neurons that perceived, paid attention to, and processed our cinema experience. Now, when a fragment of last night's cinema memory is engaged or someone asks if you've seen the movie, the associated network activates and you remember much, perhaps all. A neural network stores memories. The picture of my primary school teacher stands out in my brain. As my visual cortex activates her image, my auditory cortex activates her voice, my olfactory cortex activates her aura, and so on. When we remember something, we reactivate the many pieces of information we experienced, stitched together. Similarly, retrieval isn't like choosing a DVD or downloading data. We don't read or watch our recollections. Visual memory isn't like browsing your smartphone's photo library, which can be zoomed in and out. We're not seeing a picture. Memory is an associative scavenger hunt that activates numerous brain regions. Memories aren't replayed, it is retrieved when one component of the memory is triggered, activating the associated memory circuit. Pay attention in memory building. Memory requires attention, and along with perception seeing, hearing, smelling, and feeling. Attention is must to remember. Our memory does not record everything we see and hear. Rather, we remember what we focus on. And since we can't focus on everything, we'll only recall some of what's happening. Our senses are open for 57,600 seconds. If we're awake for 16 hours a day, which is a lot of data, but we don't remember much. Remembering is a reconstruction job that activates several brain regions to rebuild memories. We recall, not replay. Attention requires effort. We must wake up, focus, and activate our brains to remember things. We retain what we focus on. Therefore, we should be alert. Optimists always remember good times. Alternatively, you're less likely to remember happy events when depressed. We notice and remember what's intriguing, relevant, useful, new, surprising, significant, emotional, and momentous. We neglect the rest. Our world is interconnected yet distracted, and minimizing distractions improves memory. Sleep, meditation, and caffeine help us to concentrate more.
multitasking or dividing attention when our brain is trying to create memory reduces the strength of its reproduction. Even if the information does solidify while your attention is divided, it may not be strong enough to be fully retrieved later. Further, repetition strengthens memory, but we need focused attention to generate it well. Categories of Human Memory Short-Term Memory The short-term memory is the working memory in our prefrontal brain where we temporarily store current sights, sounds, scents, tastes, emotions, and language. It is constantly at work to keep anything we recently experienced and paid attention to, only long enough for the decision to use it or not. If the brain decides to hold, then it connects one moment to another, giving us a whole picture. It is a visuospatial scratch pad working memory, and with this, we can keep both visual and oral information for 15 to 30 seconds. Repetition helps our working memory in retaining knowledge as our hippocampus will consolidate this into a longer-term memory. In Henry Malaisen's post-surgery case, he continued to retain some memories for a few seconds. He could repeat a phone number, but he would forget it a minute later. Though his hippocampus was gone, his prefrontal cortex was still intact, through which he remembered the present moment or his current consciousness. Muscle memory we have two types of long-term memory, conscious and subconscious. The implicit unconscious memory is commonly known as muscle memory, which holds the ability to perform and repeat a previously learned skill. With repetition and deliberate practice, we can combine complicated sequences of previously unconnected physical actions into a single, effortless action. When the pattern is memorized, it can be done faster, more correctly and without thinking. So we can play guitar, drive to work, dribble a football, or walk to the kitchen without thinking about it. Muscle memory is a misleading term. Our arms and legs might appear to remember the dance's steps after we learn them, but the choreography is actually stored in our brain, not in our muscles. Muscle memory is unconscious and stored below our awareness. Muscle memories are bound together by a part of the brain called the basal ganglia. As we continue to learn the skill, another part of the brain called the cerebellum provides additional feedback. Muscle memory consolidation takes lots of focused practice. The motor cortex's connected neuronal's firing stores a skill's memory. These neurons control all our voluntary muscles via spinal cord connections. Muscle memories, like other memories, improve with practice. Muscle memories are automatic. Doing things is remembered subconsciously. By cycling stimulates my intellect. We are unconsciously accessing memories and activating brain networks while pedaling, balancing, steering, and braking. Muscle memories are retrieved daily, unintentionally. While we use muscle memory, the brain's higher functions of thinking, imagination, and decision-making can continue. However, some repetition and effort work much better, like spaced learning, self-testing, meaning, and visual and spatial imagery that increase semantic memory. Semantic memory, due to the perceived importance of the information, the hippocampus will store long-term memories after the information has been given attention and removed from the working memory. The things we know and the events that have occurred are stored in our conscious memories. This type of stuff is called semantic memory, which stores our life and global knowledge and is our brain's Wikipedia. This information can be recalled without remembering the details of its acquisition. Knowledge without time or place is called semantic memory, which is data without context. If we want to know a lot, we must be good at building and retrieving semantic memories because all of our material is semantic. Studying and practicing to retain information is the key to long-term, semantic memory. Episodic memory. Episodic memory is time traveling and is our life history. Some memories last forever, while others are forgotten the next day. How can we remember some life events in great detail, robustly, and easily, but not others. What makes certain memories stick and others fade? Episodic memory dislikes repetition. We don't keep what is ordinary, typical, or expected. Our brains find it simpler to recall important, 
surprising, and emotional information than routine and accustomed information. Things that are significant, emotional, and surprising are easier for our brains to remember than things that are mundane and familiar. You'll notice that all the dinners you remember were special. They disappear otherwise. Emotional life events triumphants, failures, falling in love, humiliations, weddings, divorces, births, and deaths are remembered. Emotion and surprise activate a region of the brain called the amygdala, which then sends robust signals to the hippocampus to convey the significance of the information that we want to remember. Our brain then stores contextual facts like where we were, who we were with, when this happened, how we felt, etc. Flashbulb memory. If we experience something highly unexpected and exceptionally emotional, we might create what is known as a flashbulb memory. Flashbulb memories aren't photographic, as the name suggests, but they do contain a lot of vivid detail for episodic information about where you were, who you were with, the date, what you were wearing, what you and others said, the weather, and how you felt much more so than you remember for the day before that event or even what happened last week. Flashbulbs are episodic memories of experiences that were shocking and highly significant to you and evoked big emotions like fear, rage, grief, joy, and love. Autobiographical memory. When our most significant episodic memories are strung together, they create the story of our life, and this collection is referred to as our autobiographical memory or our highlight reel. And it is not necessarily a tale of unique things. Rather, it depends on the kind of life story we wanted to create and the identity and outlook we like. Since we create our own autobiographical memories, this is what we remember most, other than flashbulb memories. But most of life's episodic memories are likely to be clustered between the ages of 15 and 30, which is called the reminiscence bump. These episodes are what we remember most about life. However, some people with highly superior autobiographical memory HSIM can remember practically every day of their lives from late infancy on. HSAM people fewer than 100 worldwide recall every day, no matter how commonplace. Some see HSIM as a superpower, yet others feel cursed. They vividly recall their worst, most terrible days breakups, deaths, mistakes, regrets, losses, and humiliations. These people view their memory ability as a Greek tragedy. They suffer from having their ultimate wish of remembering everything. Perspective memory. Perspective memory is our memory for what we need to do later. This kind of memory is a bit like mental time travel. We're creating an intention for our future. This is our brain's to-do list, a memory to be recalled at a future time and place. It is fraught with forgetting. For a perspective memory to be remembered and not forgotten, the intention or the action that needs to be performed later needs first to be encoded into memory. But because we sometimes set up not so great cues or miss the cues when we're supposed to notice them, this kind of memory is highly susceptible to failure. Prospective memory is unreliable in all of us. And if we are relying on your prospective memory, we need to help it by making a to-do list, entering the information in our calendar, being specific about our plan, using pillbox, placing the cues in impossible to miss location, being aware if the routine has been disrupted, etc. Why we forget. Memory can be altered even after it has been stored. Memories can fade if left alone. Physical neuronal connections can retract and vanish, erasing your memories. We change memories every time we recall them. We reconstruct a recollection, not play the recording. Memory isn't a stenographer. We usually remember only a few details. With fresh information, context, and viewpoint, we omit, reinterpret, and distort. To complete our memories, we often construct new, often false, information. The present affects past memories. Today's emotions color last year's memories. Recalling episodic memories often alters them. Tip of the tongue taught. Blocking or tip of the tongue is the most prevalent memory loss. If we try to think of a word, usually a name, 
city, or book title. We know the elusive word or phrase, but we can't recall it. Remember this prohibited word. Our brain hides it like a misbehaving puppy. It's temporarily unavailable. Why? Our brain represents and connects all words. Some neurons store word images like printed letters. Other neurons record the word's meaning, sensory perceptions, emotions, and past experiences. Others manage phonological data. These neurons store the word sound and are needed to pronounce it aloud or in our thoughts. Blocking can occur when neurons that link to the term we're seeking are partially activated. Her name. Only that it starts with S. I'm stuck without neuronal's activity. It can also be caused by insufficient activation between the information that has been stored about a word and its spelling or sound. 30% to 50% of these cases resolve themselves. The word suddenly appears later. Sometimes you encounter a strong retrieval cue that activates the term. Outside help can also help. During TOT, it is not uncommon for us to see the number of syllables or the first letter of a word. These encouraging but weak clues often result in partial recollection. Psychologists name these obliquely connected phrases the target's ugly sisters, and focusing on them unknowingly makes the situation worse. These decoys lure you to pursue cerebral connections with them instead of the word you want. You now think of the ugly sister whenever you try to recall the word. Tot doesn't signify Alzheimer's. 25-year-olds on average have numerous tots per week. But young people don't worry about them because memory loss, Alzheimer's, old age, and mortality don't concern them. Because of the natural degeneration of our brains as we get older, the incidence of TOTS typically increases. And because aging and Alzheimer's are more apparent, we notice them more as we get older. Word blockage is particularly worrisome and personal if we have Alzheimer's disease in our family. But TOTS are typical memory glitches caused by brain organization. Therefore, as glasses help us to see, and we can also use Google if a word is stuck. Memory is transient. If not engaged, a memory will eventually be wiped. We forget more with longer retention intervals. Memory degrades quickly, but it doesn't disappear, and trace memories help us to activate and recall the list. Memory can also be physiologically erased. Recent research has demonstrated that if a memory's synapses aren't stimulated, they'll physically disappear. Neurons will physically disconnect from adjacent neurons if they are inactive for too long. Further, how we use information in our brains affects its longevity. Repetition and meaning are the major approach us to fighting memory loss. Keep stimulating your brain to remember what you've learned. Repeat the information. Recall, rehearse, and repeat. Our brain likes meaning. We can make a memory stick by telling a tale or placing it in a meaningful event in your life. Meaningful memories are more likely to be thought about, shared, used, and reminisced about. Forgetting facilitate better memory. Forgetting is the villain in the epic war against everyone's favorite hero, remembering. But forgetting doesn't automatically mean aging, dementia, or failure. Sometimes it's better to forget. Forgetting unwanted, irrelevant, distracting, or traumatic memories is beneficial. Forgetting helps us focus on and remember other things. Forgetting is also our default. Our brain will forget information unless we actively remember it, and certainly over 50, too easily. We also forget automatically. Forgetting makes us helpless. But artful, deliberate, motivated, focused, and desirable forgetfulness is possible. An intelligent memory system remembers and deletes useless information to concentrate on more useful things. Remembering is hard, but forgetting is too. A well-balanced memory system remembers and forgets both. Aging of memory. Age-related memory decline is not a disease. Aging doesn't affect memory, at least not muscle memory. Unless we have a brain disease or injury, we will still be able to dress and eat ourselves at 60. Muscle memories are stable through the ages. However, the performance may be declined due to slower reaction times, 
weaker muscles, poorer vision and hearing. With age, we accumulate knowledge, and thankfully, this doesn't go away. Older people know more than younger people. And we continue to be able to consolidate and store semantic memories as we age. But many memory functions do normally decline as we age. While our free recallability might feel as if it's plummeting as we age, recognition and familiarity are thankfully stable. Episodic memory recall also decreases normally as we age. But we experience a noticeable decline in working memory with age, both in the auditory loop and in the visuospatial scratch pad. Processing speeds normally begin diminishing in our 30s, which means it takes longer to learn new information and longer to retrieve the stored information. Our ability to sustain attention also decreases as we age. So we are less able to block out distracting stimuli when we're 50 than when we're 30, and because we need to pay attention to create new memories, our ability to remember suffers. Although aging happens and is an unavoidable part of being human but using the strategies and insights of paying attention, decreasing distractors, rehearsing, self-testing, creating meaning, using visual and spatial imagery, and keeping a diary will improve memory at Alzheimer. The forgetfulness due to Alzheimer's is different from the amnesia that occurs with normal aging due to lower processing speed or attention. In the case of Alzheimer's disease, dementia begins in its early stages with a molecular conflict in the neuronal synapses that consolidate and retrieve memories, making them impassable, which, gradually, causes the neuron's death. Most neuroscientists believe that this happens due to the formation of plaques by amyloid beta protein. In the beginning, the person is blissfully unaware. But later, after 15 to 20 years, a chemical cascade promotes tangles, inflammation, cell death, and pathological amnesia. Amyloid plaques are like a lit match, which alone can't cause a problem. But at the tipping point, the match sets fire to the forest near it. When our brain is ablaze with Alzheimer's disease, we experience significant, abnormal memory loss. In fact, Alzheimer's begins in the hippocampus, which is the brain structure essential for the formation of new, consciously held memories. Thus, the first indication of Alzheimer's forgetfulness is that we start failing to remember what happened today or simply moments ago and repeat the same story or topic. New information that would typically be consolidated by the hippocampus and available for retrieval is lost. Older memories are safe. Alzheimer's patients can recall walking to school 60 years ago, but not what they had for lunch an hour earlier. Alzheimer's patients start to use simpler terms. Instead of luggage, use a bag, and paper instead of a document. This kind of blocking isn't a problem initially but becomes an inconvenience later on, which ultimately disrupts speech and causes severe memory loss. This is dementia. But Alzheimer's does not stay only in the hippocampus. It goes beyond on a murderous drip of invading other regions of brain. Alzheimer's patients get lost in familiar areas as the disease spreads to the parietal lobes, which process spatial information. The brain's most recently developed prefrontal and frontal cortices will likewise be affected by Alzheimer's. These regions hinder rationality, decision-making, planning, and problem-solving. Alzheimer's disease disrupts the production of new memories, but it eventually and tragically destroys the brain networks that preserve our oldest memories. From forgetfulness to end-stage Alzheimer's, it takes 8 to 10 years. This disorder severely inhibits all memory development and retrieval. Alzheimer's disease causes widespread, catastrophic, and devastating forgetting. Memory Improvement Tips Paying Attention As memory creation requires attention, paying attention is the number one thing we can do to improve our memory at any age. Conversely, lack of attention will impel it. Every time, we rehearse and self-test the visual and spatial imagery, mnemonics, surprise, emotion, and meaning, all will improve our memory. Context Further, our ability to remember also depends on the context. Memory retrieval is far easier, faster, 
and more likely to be fully summoned when the context of recall matches the context that was present when the memory was formed. But context means more than just where we were when we formed or recalled a memory. It can also mean whom we were with, the time of day or year, and the weather. Nor is it limited to what's outside of you. Context can be internal or emotional or physiological state. Stress The relentless, unmanaged stress is toxic for our bodies and brain. Acute stress can interfere with recall, and that chronic stress can literally shrink our hippocampus. Sleep Humans spend a third of their lives asleep. Why would humans and other animals have evolved to devote so much time to doing nothing? Sleep is not an optional state of doing nothing. Sleep is a biologically busy state that is vital to our health, our survival, and our optimal functioning. Insufficient sleep puts us at a higher risk for heart disease, cancer, infection, mental illness, Alzheimer's, and memory impairment. Therefore, sleep is clearly doing something super powerful, and with respect to memory, sleep plays a critical role in many ways. First, we need to sleep to pay attention. If we don't get enough sleep tonight, our frontal cortex is going to be dragging itself to its desk job in the morning, and our ability to concentrate is going to be sluggish. The first step in creating a memory is noticing what you're going to remember. And to notice anything, we need to both perceive it and pay attention to it. So by ensuring that our frontal cortex neurons are alert, active, and ready for duty, sleep provides us with the attention we need to encode new memories. But attention boosting is probably the least impressive of sleep's powerful effects on memory. Sleeping also hits the save button on these newly encoded memories. It saves memories in two steps. First, the unique pattern of neural activity that occurred in our brain when we were experiencing, learning, and even rehearsing something while awake are reactivated during sleep. This neural replay is thought to facilitate the linking of these connections, cementing them into a single memory. Sleep helps consolidate new memories, and insufficient sleep interferes with consolidation. In addition to improving episodic and semantic memories, sleep also optimizes muscle memory. Sleep appears to be helpful for all muscle memory skills. People need sleep to consolidate the consciously deliberate, separate steps of a task into automated, seamless muscle memory.